Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning into Screw the Cubicle TV. I'm Lydia Lee, the freedom instigator at Screw the Cubicle, and thank you so very much for taking the time today to join us for another conversation about living an unconventional life and getting the inspiration that you need for your own career reinvention and life transitions. So in today's series for the Corporate Escape Stories, I'm so excited to interview Paul Higgins from Build, Live, Give. Now, I love Paul's story of choosing work that is more aligned with his values, which is making it more meaningful for him to pursue. Now, after being in a very high positioned uh, corporate gig, uh, it's not an easy decision to give up a sure thing to really venture into that unknown world of entrepreneurship. So we spoke about why we have to be really honest about whether our lifestyle and career choices are leading us to a life experience that we truly really want to have. So I invited Paul to share his corporate transition story from working as a business director at Coca-Cola and how his health issues instigated his motivation to be an entrepreneur instead. Paul's also a father uh, of teenage kids and he has a spouse to enroll into his cubicle escape journey. So in our interview together, he shared the steps he took to prepare for entrepreneurship with a family and in hindsight, what he would have done differently. I also loved picking Paul's brain on his five rapid growth drivers to expedite business success, something that he teaches his tribe at Build, Live, Give. And I know it's going to be really helpful to you to gain some clarity on what to focus on when you want to build a thriving business. We also dove into how you can stop being distracted by shiny things that you think you have to do in your business and really focus on the foundational business building strategies that can make a, a big difference in your success. So now now, without further ado, here's my interview with Paul. Escape the nine to five and create your path to freedom. Okay, thank you, Paul, for joining me today on this video interview series. Great to be here, Lydia. And is it morning? Is it morning time for you in Australia? I always have to it remember is. what time zone we're in these days. It is morning time, <laughs> and if you hear a bit of noise in the background, it's actually torrential rain here this morning. So oh. uh, we're trying to get out of winter, but we haven't quite got there. So uh, it's not the That's best right. of mornings, but mm. a great morning to be inside doing a video. That's right, exactly. Um, well, I'm in Vancouver, so it's summer here. It's the opposite, isn't it? In in Australia, it's the winter when it's summer in North America. Yes. Yeah, which is, well, your winter is not incomparable to Canadian winter. So we won't, we're not going to give you a cry story there about how cold it is. No, no, get no. That part, right? <laughs> no. We don't get many minuses in front of us, but uh, yeah. That's it's right. A little, just a little wet today. Yeah, awesome. Well, for a lot of people that don't know who you are and what you do, I would love to uh, talk a little bit more about your story. So before we dive into the juicy parts of this interview, uh, I would love to ask you what instigated your escape from your cubicle and why did you transition to entrepreneurship? Yeah, look, uh, so I was a director at Coca-Cola. I sort of started as a uh, sales rep and worked my way all the way up to a director over 18 years, and it was fantastic. And I was sort of a bit of an entrepreneur. I always took on the hardest challenges if they had to fix something. So as an example, here in Australia, we had really low presence in juice, in um, fruit juice. And they basically said, look, it, we're high everywhere else in the world, Paul, just go and set up a business and do that. And, you know, I, I started from basically scratch and, and uh, got it to th over $300 million in, wow. in a couple of years. And that was sort of, you know, I loved it. I, I sort of had the best of both worlds. I had all the, the might of, uh, you know, one of the best companies in the world, Coca-Cola, but I also got to uh, launch my own businesses within that. And mm. that, that was fantastic. And also I love the fact that we were both, you know, a global business, best practice, but we also uh, worked a lot with small businesses. So I was nearly like a small business consultant. So it was a great journey, but I really had three key things that made me change that. And one was my health. I've got an inherited condition called polycystic kidney disease. It's not life-threatening, but my specialist basically said, you keep doing what you're doing in corporate and you're going to have kidney failure in you know a couple of years time. Right. Or you can try to prolong it. And roughly you sort of can stay at worst case on dialysis for about 20 years. So I want to see my grandkids and whatever I thought. So that's, you know, that's not acceptable. I've got to do something. The second was my family. I wanted to spend more time. My, my teenage kids, you know, they'd sort of, 
you know, they'd walk into a room where I was there, walk straight to my wife and ask her a question. I'm thinking, what, why don't they ask me? And then I thought, well, <laughs> why would they ask me? Because I'm, I'm never around. So right. it wouldn't matter what dad said. So, you know, I, I've actually got a, uh, one of our frequent flyers, uh, Qantas is a airline you've probably heard of. I'm yes. actually a gold member for life because I used to fly <laughs> that much. Yeah. So, Sounds like my yeah. background because if you, well, I did a podcast interview with you and a lot of my corp, what happened in my corporate job was just living in hotel rooms, you know, sounds really sexy on paper, traveling job, you know, in beautiful places like Paris, but you never see the outside of a conference room or a hotel room. <laughs> yeah. But I, and you know, the third thing for me was, you know, I had a double life. I had this life that I'd read every morning saying that's the person I want to be. And then I was acting as someone different. And, you know, I wasn't, you know, my goal in life wasn't to fill kids with sugar. And that's unfortunately, right. you know, Coca-Cola, Coca that's, you know, it became quite, um, yeah, my, my values just fell out of uh, the company I worked in. So I loved the business. I think it was one of the best run businesses in the world, but I just didn't love what they did. And uh, those three things caused me to, to leave in 2011. Mm, so it's been a little while now that you've been an entrepreneur. Now, did you know right away what you wanted to do to replace your income? Or was it something of a, a bit of a process to do that? Look, I'd been threatening to leave for about 10 years. Right. So, you know, I, every year I'd go on a, a golf trip with my friends and every year I'd say, I'm going to leave next year. I won't be at Coca-Cola. And I'd say, look, Paul, when you, when you cut, you bleed Coke, you don't bleed blood. You know, it's so, because my father worked there. I met my wife there. It was so ingrained in my world. And they said, you'll never leave. And I kept, you know, each year I'd have all these ideas and I just didn't know what to do. And, and I got that unhappy at the end. And because of those three things I, I, I mentioned, I just said, look, I'm just going to leave and I'll yeah. find something to do. I'll just yeah. take the brave step because I'm not happy uh, with who I am and what I'm doing. And there's got to be something better than this. So I ended yeah. up just taking a leap and I leapt into coaching, which was the thing that I, you know, sort of passionately loved helping people. So that's where I started my journey when I left corporate. And what did you coach on initially when, when you first uh, decided to build your, your business? Yeah, well, look, I sort of took a bet each way. I actually helped corporate people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of the biggest banks in the world, some of other FMCG and fast uh, moving consumer goods companies. I sort of coached people that were in similar roles to me. Right. Uh, and I realized that I couldn't help them. Like the problems they were dealing with were often the ones that I left corporate for. So right. I was like, oh, that's not really working. And then I was also coaching some small businesses. And uh, I really, really love that. But coaching, uh, when I went through and got my accreditation, coaching in its purest form is really getting the the, the person to look at, you know, you help them look at different perspectives, but they come up with the answer themselves. That's right. And, and I realized I just don't have the patience for that. <laughs> like, you know, I, I just would sit there and think, well, you know, you could do this, you could do that. I'm an ideas guy. And I just thought, this is crazy. I'm sitting there. I'm like torturing myself not to say anything. Mm. Wouldn't it be better if I just flipped it and, and became an advisor? And actually, when people came and asked for help, I'd still use my coaching methodology sure. when needed, but I wouldn't have to stay a pure coach. And I, and I think a lot of people get confused with coach, mentor. And for me, I, I, you know, I'm, I want to be the best at what I do. So that's why I decided, no, look, I'll, I'll venture out of coaching and go into advice. Mm. And again, the, the thing, you know, the word coach can be defined in so many ways, right? Everyone coaches yes. differently and everyone helps and contributes differently. And I kind of went through a very similar path where, you know, Screw the Cubicle was not my first business. It was sort of an accident from a blog of a journal of my identity crisis into someone going, do you coach? And that's when I went, oh, what's a coach? And then, you know, the, uh, the rest is history. But in the beginning, I had the same thought, Paul. I was like, am I going to get annoyed? at people's problems because maybe I like to talk about it and blog about it and, you know, speak to people in cafes about it, but maybe I don't actually want to dig that deep into your emotional trauma <laughs> to get into a place that you want to get to. But, you know, I didn't want to be a therapist at that point, but you know, I yes. took about eight guinea pigs of clients and really found out half of those people I would probably never want to work with again because there's issues I didn't enjoy coaching on. And then yes. there were some issues I enjoyed coaching on so that it is a process, isn't it? You never know for sure right away until you give it a shot. And then work out what you like and don't like in that role. Spot on. And, and I think, you know, people always say I'm waiting for the perfect time. And I just think there is no perfect time. So, and there's only two camps, you know, some that 
do something on the side while they're still in corporate to you know get up some income and, and I think that makes sense so you can test some stuff working on the side I think that makes sense and then there's yes. other people like me that just you know cut the bridge so I worked with a really high performance coach at Coca-Cola and his view was all the best people in the world and he'd interviewed all the top athletes and business people around the world and his view was if you burn the bridge if there's no option other than to succeed you will so I took that approach and mm. basically just burnt my bridges and said look you got to make this work yeah absolutely now I want to talk a little bit about your family because uh, you know a lot of times when I when I get people you know in, at, at watching a video from screw the cubicle or learning about my story they'll say to me you know Lydia um, you don't have children and you don't have a family and that's why it's really easy for you to do this so what you did doesn't apply to me and hey fair enough I can't speak about what that anxiety could be like when you have a family to feed and when you've got a spouse to support and and you know be on the same page you can't always just be your way and not everyone else's way whereas my situation is whatever I want to do tomorrow I can jump on a plane and do it now when you were deciding to leave corporate now I'm assuming that wasn't an overnight decision right I, I'm assuming that you budgeted for it you sort of hopefully talked to your wife about it uh, how did you sort of enroll your family into your escape plan because um, you need them to support you but also they could get mad <laughs> that you've been you know you've been in your career for so many years it seems like something quite secure and safe to just give up right so how did you prepare your family for this lifestyle change yeah, look, the truth is not as well as I'd like. So I'll sort of give you what happened and I'll also give you what I'd do if I did it again. Great. But what, what I sort of did well was we always had family goals. So we'd sit down and, you know, sort of like once a year we'd go away and we'd sit down and I was always a big planner, uh, you know, setting goals, et cetera. But I would actually say to the family, well, what do we want to do as a family? So we always had family goals. They certainly didn't go to the degree that I would, um, personally, but it was great. So we always, you know, came together as a family. So I sort of talked my family through it. They were certainly aware of what I was going to do. So that, that was all great. So that was the good side of it. And we also set goals of what we we're going to do together as a family. So we um, were very lucky enough to travel. So, you know, I'd always travel with Coca-Cola. Like I said before, you know, I had uh, always on a plane, but this time I thought I'm going to take my family and, and we didn't put our kids in uh, some of the best schools in um, Melbourne, Australia, we actually decided to take some money and actually put that into their world education. Mm. So we went to South Africa, we went to the Philippines, um, we took them to Europe for two two months. So that was all part of our goal. So that was the good side. The, the side that I would have done better on reflection was actually saying to my wife, look, this is the amount of money I'm going to make each month. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set those goals and I'm not going to talk about my business, whether it's going well or, or not well. I'm just going to make sure that I'm delivering you that amount of money and right. that amount of money, let's agree on. And if I can't deliver that amount of money, well, then we need to do something different. But what I did was basically told her all the problems in the business all the time mm -hmm. because, you know, you've got to talk to somebody. Totally. And unfortunately, I didn't have a community then and that's part of the reason why I created, you know, Build, Live, Give. But mm. I didn't have a community. So I used to share all the downside with, with Linda, my wife. And I also didn't really commit to a dollar value. So it seemed to go on forever. So for mm. over the f five years, it was sort of, you know, I'd muddy the water saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm spending all this money through the business that we'd normally spend anyway and you know I was you know just just making it up really and I wasn't achieving what I wanted to so I definitely would have made that clearer mm. and I would have made sure that I was in a community where I could talk about my problems and my challenges and not burden my wife with those because mm. you know, that that was thing but but I'm very fortunate my wife um I've got a lot of friends in corporate where um they have uh, they always talk to me about how their wife you know, loves spending money. My wife's the opposite. She doesn't love, I have to force her to go and buy a dress. Mm. Wow. So from, from that perspective, it, it really helped me um, because she, you know, she adjusted very quickly to the fact that we didn't have enough cash. We had lots of assets and, you know, and lots of shares. So that was all fine. But when you haven't got cash coming in, you, and you're always used to having success, you feel very, um, I felt like I couldn't spend anything. Because mm. I wasn't making money, even though I had lots of money. If that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, 
Now, with, with, in terms of the money part, because, you know, it's quite natural for a business not to make money for the first six months to a year sometimes. Sometimes if you're lucky to break even, that's a good, good news right there without being in the loss minus zone, right? Uh, now, did you have to sort of prepare things financially with your family? Like, you know, be able to tell your wife, for example, that, hey, I've saved up or I am, will, you know, we've cut down costs to be able to afford right? This experimentation for the first year of business. Um, was there like a condition that you have to set with her? It's like, hey, listen, if we run through this money in our savings and we're down to our last hundred dollars here in the savings account, I will do my due diligence to go get a consulting job or something to make sure we're safe as a family. Were there any conditions that had to be set with your spouse? Look, as, as I said, I, I don't think I did that well. It, mm. um, I think what you've just articulated is the right way to do it. We didn't quite do it that way. We were fortunate that my wife was still working in corporate and therefore I had that to sort of fall back on a, a little. Now, the downside of that is she really didn't like a job. She actually wanted to leave, but she right. felt compelled to stay there because I wasn't earning or I wasn't clear about the money that I was going to give her. So I think that's something that I would have uh, done um, uh, differently. But yeah, look, we 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 were lucky. We were, you know, I, I could see that the share price for Coca Cola was going to fall because you know I was sitting in global meetings and thinking these guys have got their head in the sand around sugar. <laughs> right. Um, this is crazy. This the shares the stock's going to fall. So I basically sold all of my shares when I left, and that gave me a lovely uh, nest egg. And I, and I know this sounds. Not the nicest thing to say, but I actually, over those five years, I could just see the share price continually fall. So that was mm -hmm. sort of validation to say, well, at least you've made one good decision. Even though you're not making a lot of cash at the moment in your business, you've actually got the, the money from the shares to mm. uh, keep it going. Yeah, and I think for, for people who don't have access to shares and, you know, something that's a bit of a buffer, right, financially for them to rely on, it, I mean, the logical thing is that you'll have to save them, right, which is what I had to do. I had no shares waiting for me <laughs> anywhere, um, you know, and so it was about nine months of, of living expenses to be, to be saved up because I felt safe. My conditions were... Um, I need a six months of living expenses that if for a rainy day, if something happens, I have that pot of money to dig into. And that allowed me to feel better, right, about, about leaving and also feeling I'm not a risky, you know, person, like I'm a calculated risk person. And I think most people are, right? We're not a let's jump off a cliff and hope our parachute opens kind of people. Like some people are a little braver. I think you were a little braver than I was when you sort of went, screw it. I'm just going to go for it and go and, and get to it. And I was definitely not like that, you know? So uh, I don't think it has to be that sort of mentality of just jump and hope things happen for you, but actually be really smart and responsible, right? Whether you're single or with family to get those finances in order so that when you do take that leap, it's safer. Yeah. And I think for us, we'd always had a financial planner. Ah, so okay. You know, so it was over the 10 years of me deciding to leave, I'd always had this in the back of my mind. So it was preparing yeah. over a long period of time. So even at the end, it looked like, well, it was a rash decision. I'd actually build up our wealth. And that's why, you know, build, live, give is about, you know, building your own dream business, but living well. So yeah. part of that living is making sure you've got uh, wealth outside of your business because you running your own business is the most risky thing you can really do. Absolutely. So you got to make sure that you're using that income to spread that risk and then obviously giving back when you've got more than enough to, to give back to others. So Ooh, um, yeah, it had been a journey that it, it wasn't just a one-off moment. For sure. Absolutely. Now talking about the beginning stage of a, a new entrepreneur and a business, right? We talked about finance and sort of enrolling, right? Your support systems and your family into your new dream. Uh, one of the things that sort of happens around this stage as well, and a lot of the, the viewers of this uh, interview uh, are in this stage uh, where they always sort of tell me a little bit about like, you know, it's so much information of what it takes or what I'm seeing out there in the wild, wild west of the world wide web. Lots of W's there. <laughs> <laughs> where it's just like amazing that we're living in the time, time and age where we have access to great information, where you and I can be in different continents and have a conversation, which is great, but it brings in a new whack of problems, which is like overstimulation and over information and over education. Uh, and we get very stuck on not knowing what to do next because there's so many, so much noise out there telling us what to do. 
So as new entrepreneurs, we are very distracted by it's like, oh my God, that's the shiny thing I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to run webinars. No, it's Facebook ads. No, it's funnel strategy. You know, it can be sort of like that, that up movie, right? That Pixar movie, like squirrel. And then you just distract yourself once again. Uh, and you and I both know from running businesses for about five years our, ourselves as well is that um, it's much easier to focus on one thing at a time and also be prioritizing what's most important, right? In your stage of business. So uh, what's your advice like for a new entre entrepreneur that is being influenced a lot by what's out there and sort of what I call business pornography, right? Just like looking at what everyone else is doing and not checking in on whether or not that's something good for me to do. Uh, what's your advice on sort of discerning that information for our business and not getting stuck in that shiny squirrel zone and really have that laser focus on what really is priority for our business? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And, and I spent five years in that zone, right? So I, I know it really, really well. And so what worked for me is uh, joining a mastermind. So that in 2016, I, I really rolled the dice the last time because for me, you know, I couldn't really go back and get a job because of my health. You know, my kidney failure, or, you know, I was nearly at kidney failure. I was about 20% kidney function by then. Wow. So I really couldn't go back and get a job in corporate and I just wasn't earning the money. And my wife was saying, look, I want to leave my job. This is not working. So in short, I joined a mastermind and it really taught me to get rid of all of the shiny objects and really focus on the stuff that, that matters. So I set a 90 day plan and I executed against that. So I had very clear goals. I had very clear strategies and I've found that the art of doing less and, you know, I, I sort of had always done that in, in corporate, but in small business, as, you know, the results weren't coming, I just thought that, you know, trying more things was the solution. But I realized trying the right things was uh, much better. And actually learning from those that had already gone before you was yeah. much better rather than trying to create it all yourself. So that's when I joined the mastermind. It was hugely successful. And that really turned my whole mm. career around. And that's what then gave me the motivation motivation to go out and do the same thing so I think you know and when I said it was lonely and I was sort of talking to my wife a lot with all the problems I think you know being in a mastermind where you share um, your key challenges and someone says well look this was my experience when that happened and you can learn and listen to other people going through experiences and and gain and implement that I think that is a, a massive um, advantage to stop this whole shiny, mm. uh, shiny object in, um, syndrome. And it's also about accountability too. It's like yeah. every week turning up and saying, this is what I'm going to do next week. And then in front of, you know, 10, 15 people saying, did you achieve that? I found that uh, made a massive difference to mm. my focus and the outcomes I achieved. So it sounds like being a part of a mastermind. So one of the big things for you that made the difference was accountability, right? Having someone other than yourself and your poor wife <laughs> to know yes. about your, your progress and, and, and what needs to happen in your business. But also uh, you talked about a bit about, you know, being around people that have done the things you dream to do, right? Not just in the beginner mode, but actually people in different stages of business so that you can uh, a validate where, where you were uh, coming from and also helping someone behind you, which is really nice as a, as a business owner and then being able to see ahead, right. And go, sort of go, where am I heading to and who do I respect in the industry? Um, and and I'm, I'm in the same boat, except I started with more one-on-one -on -one coaching with a strategic yes. coach, which really helped me immensely. And then from that foundational part of um, uh, mentorship uh, and knowing what I want to build, then I needed more sort of day-to-day -day, uh, access, right, to a larger pool of people that could share resources. Because I think at the end of the day, research and figuring out how to do something, you can spend oodles of hours lost in that realm, right? Versus actually being a part of a thing like a mastermind, you sort of go, does anyone know what tool I need for this and that? And get a real answer right away. And that saves time, it saves headspace and so forth. Now, what has really worked for me, and I'm not sure what, uh, if that's been the case for you, is that not just choosing any mastermind ran by even someone famous or you know someone that looks great, 
in their brand, but actually being mindful about, for me anyway, um, choosing the right type of influencer or business owner that does business the way that I like to do it. Like it doesn't actually matter. I don't care if you're a $5 million business owner, but if you, to get there was all about automation and just tools and stuff that you're going to teach me, which is no judgment, nothing wrong with that. But my style of business is intimacy and a very different type of model. And so I needed to be really careful about who I, who I chose to mentor me. Uh, that wasn't only based on their success of financial gain, but actually around their values, you know, and how they approach business that needs to be aligned. Has that been like that for you too? Yeah, it looked totally. And I think, you know, running a, you know, if you look at a million dollar business versus a $10 million business, very different to running billion dollar businesses like I did it at, at uh, Coca-Cola and, and they are different skills and excuse me, I totally agree. You need, to have that alignment. And that's where I struggle because all the masterminds that I was in, everyone was just focused on the money. So it was all mm. about getting to that seven, eight figures. You know, it was all the same copy, all the same thing. They all cared about what car they drove, what watch they wore. Right. You know, it was very material. And that's just not me. And, and you know, for, and that's why I sort of created my own at the end mm. because I couldn't find that value alignment. So I think, um, yeah, you've got to be with, like-minded people, values that are, that are aligned, as you said. I think that's uh, really important. Uh, I think, you know, the, the other thing is that um, I'll give you a great example is like a virtual assistant. I think every uh, business owner should have a virtual assistant or assistant of some form. Um, you know, normally virtual is the best. And, you know, there's just so many out there in the world. So who do you pick? You, you could spend all of this time trying to research and find the right ones. But I know we've done all that hard work. I ran my own outsourcing and VA company for, oh, for five years. So, so I know this topic really well. So when people come to me, I say, well, look, given your situation, here's a company that I could refer you to. It's trusted and that saves people lots of hours of chasing webinars, funnels and everything yeah. to try to get to the right product. I've cut all of that out. And, and, and my job is to basically do all the research. And I know you do a similar thing. You then, you know, cause you're looking and you're got like-minded people, you're doing the research and it's a lot, a lot more efficient because you're doing it for lots of like people. Mm. Whereas if you're just doing it for yourself and time is your most critical asset, you can churn and waste so much time trying to pick the right experts. So now that's one of the core things that I've really struggled with because I thought everyone was like Coke where they were the best supplier. They always did what they said they were going to do and life would be easy. But I got burnt so many times. I spent you know, $15,000 on an online course that never saw the light of day because the guy just disappeared. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's a real pain point I see out there and that's something that we definitely uh, solve. And, mm. um, you know, don't spend all your time doing research because that, stops you normally from selling which is the key thing you've got to do as That's your right. own business owner and yeah. also delivering yeah and what your role the best role you play is the thing that people pay you for right it's that thing you do Stop. that you know, and, and no one's paying you for research no one's paying you to uh, go on canva and try to figure out how to do the best social media image like that's not your job Right. And I think that's a great point to make is that as a business owner, there's lots of roles to play. You're everyone at the, in the beginning. And maybe you do have to be, uh, you start off as an intern <laughs> in your own yes. company to sort of yes. understand what the moving parts are, which is great. But at some point when you need to focus on sales and getting customers and landing gigs so that you can pay the bills and feed yourself, you're going to have to start being picky, right? About where you spend your time uh, and what's more useful of your time. That's actually what you're meant to do, right? Yeah. And if you've got like in corporate, you know, I built my career over 18 years and I had, you know, didn't have kids at the start and it was a lot less, you know, it was a lot different and I could build my skills. Now you don't, right? So you've got normally teenage kids at school for me. I've got teenage kids at school. I've got, you know, lots of uh, financial demands and I don't have, well, back then I really didn't have five years to get it right. I sort of budgeted for 12 and it, you know, it took me five. So what I really want to do is, is help people reduce that because you know you don't want to be eating into your savings yes you might have them but you'll need those for later later in life uh, we're living longer and longer so you'll need that so you know it's really about shortening that time because you're smart you'll get there yeah. by yourself at some point but wouldn't it be great to get there in you know in three months six months 12 months rather than five years and I think that's one of the benefits of joining a community like yours or a community like mine mm. to really you know 
condense that time because you don't have another 20 years to really get it right like you did in your corporate career. That's right, exactly. Now, I love the fact that you turned your own struggle points and pain points into a product, which is so, sort of like, you know, when, when we think about what should we build, sometimes that answer isn't that far away because there's stuff that frustrates you and pisses you <laughs> off that you're like, if you could change something, you would. And I think both of our businesses was in a way a tribute to our own struggle, right? Like we're helping uh, Paul and Lydia from five years ago when we're like, where the hell should we go? Uh, we're now building something to to help to expedite that learning and, and right, give that community and that support system that we didn't have that was lacking in our world. And, and you've obviously built an amazing community at uh, Built Live Give. Now, um, one of the things that we asked you before you came on this, this interview is what would you love to share with our audience? Because a lot of what we would like to do in these interviews is not only to share the stories, right, right? but to actually give people a tool, right? Something that they yes. can utilize and leverage after this interview is finished. Uh, and make something happen, like not just talk about it, but do something about it. Now, Paul, you mentioned uh, uh, the five rapid growth drivers uh, that was going to help new business owners to expedite their business success. Uh, can you talk about these five drivers and, and how do we use this and leverage this in our business right now? Yeah, great. And, and you're dead right. I back engineered it, right? So the things that I would have done, <laughs> yeah, I've now uh, Crafted. So, um, yeah, and, and, and really, and if you look at how I think our communities really work well, I know you really help people when they, they first leave, and I think that's uh, brilliant. I'm probably a little bit further down the, the line where you're sort of looking at a situation where you've got the lifestyle you wanted, but yet may not have the financial mm. freedom that you wanted. So that's where these five drivers really kick in. So Perfect. the first one is personal productivity. So that's, you know, how can we save you two hours a day to work on your business? I know it's a bit of a cliche, but, you know, mm. to change, you're going to have to find time to change. And uh, what we do is um, basically work on getting you a virtual assistant, like I said, and how you use them and also the right technology stack. So those are the things, and we really do get people two hours a day back to work then on the other four drivers, the things that will really move the needle. Ooh, the second is ideal client. And, you know, you talked about it before, finally, you know, people will resonate with you because of your values, but you've been very clear on who you serve. And I think the, the, the quicker you get to that, so many times people, I say, who's your ideal client? And they tell me, um, you know, like, a billion people. I'm like, you're never going to serve a billion people. Like actually we're lifestyle businesses. And if we get to one, $2 million, we're happy. We're not trying to build the next unicorn. So you've got to be very prescriptive around who do you serve and how do you serve them, what their pain points are. And I, I don't think people niche down enough. Totally and, true. You know, I know you and I have, have, have done a good job in that. We practice what, our, what we preach, but I think that's uh, very clear. So that's number two. And once you know that, then how are you going to serve them? So you know their pain points, their fears, their frustrations, et cetera. Then the third is the business model. So how are you going to do that? And that business model has got to align with what you want. So first you've got to work out your non-negotiables because it's no good just creating a business that actually doesn't align to what you want because you might as well just go back to corporate. So right. first set up what are the non-negotiables? Who are the competitors out there? How are they doing it? Everyone says there's no one like me. There always is someone that someone's making a decision whether they go with you or someone else. So you need to find that out mm -hmm. and have a look at that and then be very clear on what your unique value proposition is. And then off your unique value proposition, then you set your pricing. So you make sure that you're pricing right. And so often I see people looking at volume of clients and trying to get more volume. It's much easier to serve the ones you've got and price your product well and and meet all of their needs rather than constantly spending money on marketing to to attract new yeah so that. so that's the business model the fourth is sales focus because you know now that you've got your model clear you've got to go get out and sell and as i said mm -hmm. before the number one thing you've got to do is sell no one can do that for you as a small business owner you've got to do it yourself and in marketing there's sort of three ways it's free paid and joint ventures so you look at ways to attract people to you and then you look at ways of converting those and um you know that's where i think my experience is a little unique being coke sort of had some of the best uh sales training in the world so i've got that but also working with small businesses over the last seven years we've really perfected that so we help a lot with that and then the last is okay now you've got all this volume so that's great you've got all this work what you want to do is protect you. You know, you left corporate so that you can spend more time with your 
kids or you can travel the world or you can do whatever you really want. You don't want to be a slave to your business. So you need a team. So the fifth is a high performing team. So building a team, it'll probably start with the right contractors. And like I said, we've got around 150 vetted suppliers that you can tap into to um, help where you don't want to do things. So whether it's a VA, whether it's web development, you should be letting go of all the things that you're not best at to focus on sales. And then also building your overall team. So you might start to build some direct employees. And then there's some things that we've got under that. And once again, Coca-Cola was brilliant at managing. It had over 800,000 people globally just in the Coke company alone. So, um, you know, I've got all of that experience that I went through in, in development. And then we basically help people implement that with their team. So they're the five key drivers. They don't always work in uh, a linear fashion, but, you know, sure. if you look at it, they're very practical and uh, we've got key elements. And uh, later this year, we'll actually have a book out that wow, goes great. into detail to help people uh, implement those five key drivers into uh, their business. Excellent. I love those five things because, I mean, that's uh, uh, some of the most, when I was thinking, when you were talking about it, I'm also thinking about my own business as it was developing in the last five years. And there were definitely, I didn't even think about a team until I got like so busy that my life got out of hand where I was yes. like, what the hell have I done? I've created a job I don't want to go into, except I'm the boss. <laughs> I have to fire myself, uh, you know, and I didn't do that until probably didn't think about that. And to be honest, didn't think about preparing for a team, you know, and so doing it, having to go backwards, you know, when I was hiring going, shit, I don't have the systems to even onboard this person to be me in these areas because I did, I never thought about it above and beyond me, you know, and I think it's so great that you're teaching these components so that even if you are starting as a solopreneur, right, starting as, as you are the asset, this may not be where you want to end up, right, where you want to have time off, that's the whole point, and be with your families and so forth. So we have to be building our business where almost like we are already anticipating there will be a team and there, we might even sell it if potentially that would be an option for us and build it that way from the get go so that you are prepared for that, uh, that, that outcome for yourself. Yeah. And, and look, you know, I've really spent 25 years sort of collecting all of this knowledge, which, um, you know, now I can and really add value because like I said, the Coke company did great things, but also Coke companies, clients. So we work oh. with McDonald's, we work with some of the most successful companies in the world. So you got to see how they worked and, you know, how they trained their people. And so you sort of accumulated all that knowledge. And then I've worked with so many other corporate escapees and small businesses since I've left. So sort of combining those worlds are great. And corporate do some brilliant things, you know, setting a, a key objectives and, and, and having a, like a training, 70, 20, 10, you know, 70% on job, 20% within the company, 10% external, having the right training development. A lot of small business people, you know, don't get the benefit of seeing those things that corporate do. So you get that bit of corporate, but then the nimbleness and the flexibility that small business has. You know, I had a, a company the other day that um, I sold something to as a medium-sized business and it was like a $4,000 decision. And the guy's like, I can't make this decision. I'm like, hang on this is going to save you $200,000. You know, it's going to save the company $200,000, but you can't make a decision for $4,000. You've got to go up the line. And I thought, Oh, now that's the downside of corporate. Whereas in your own business, you just make those decisions, you know? So it's, yeah, I think it's uh, never been a better time to do, um, to, uh, you know, escape, you know, uh, like you help people do and, uh, and how I then help people uh, build to, to do that. and, and but, you know, take control and mm. run your own destiny. I don't think there's ever been a better time. 100%. And, and so much more availability to everyday people not having to invest a huge amount of money into a brick and mortar business, right? That, that, that internet has changed everything in that regard. It used to be that you have to take out a business loan and, you know, sell your house <laughs> to be able yeah. to have a business and not everybody can do that right? Uh, which is so great about, and, and, and th none of this, these things are being taught in universities, right? Because a lot of it is very grassroots, it's very much about mindset, it's very much about like, you know, you don't need a university education to be a business owner, but you have to think differently. You have to think out of the box and you have to think about what your assets are and what your strategies are that will be different from the guy down the street and being, um, you know, not, not someone that just copies someone else, but have the yes. capability, right, to think for yourself, to think about what's right for me, 
the values that I hold in my business and the, the choices that I want to make right in my business. Uh, so the recap, the five things are the first things, personal productivity, so important because no strategy will save you from uh, anything. If you don't find the time to actually show up for your business and take it seriously, not a, I'll do it when I'm less busy or when the children leave for college, because that will just never happen. Uh, and you'll find something else to take up your time. So that personal productivity and carving out the right time and when you'll be working on your business is super important. Uh, the second driver is uh, knowing your ideal clients, right? Being very prescriptive about how you solve their problems. Who are these people? What do they want? Uh, what values are commonly shared with myself and this client? Uh, and how can I best serve, right? Which is great. Um, Third one is about your business model, right? So all about uh, serving them and knowing how you're going to uh, provide a solution for their problem. How are you going to design the framework of your work uh, so that it has a journey, right? People sort of know what they're buying and what the hell they should be investing in uh, versus just trading dollars for hours, right? Like you're having a system, you're having a model to sell, which is great. Uh, fourth driver is sales, attracting people to your business and converting them from just a fan to an actual loyal uh, community member and, and focusing more on serving them deeply. Uh, and so it's referrals, it's longevity, sustainability, more repeat clients rather than brand new clients all the time, which is really great for service-based businesses. Uh, and then lastly, it's going to be high performing team. That's where I'm at right now. I need your help, Paul. Uh, I was actually thinking, <laughs> my God, why didn't I think of Paul to help me? We're building a team right now. Uh, so a high performing team to help you do less of the work and actually do more of what you want, which is the whole friggin point anyway <laughs> of building yes. a business to have that autonomy we forget Spot that on it yeah and and just the the one thing i say to people is just draw an org chart up so Ooh. organizational chart of your dream dream team and then what you do over a period of time is, is just as you hit certain uh, whether it's revenue or profit goals you then effectively then just take a cross and say, okay, now I've got that role replaced. Now I've got that role replaced. So you just eventually slowly replacing everything yeah. that you do. But I find that people either do one or two things. They don't do it. So they burn themselves out. Like you said, or what they do is do it too soon. Mm. They go ahead and employ all these people and then they don't get so true. the revenue that they forecast. And then that ends up imploding. So I think, you mm. know, really planning that out is a great way of doing it. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I even had to start doing that last year when I hired more full-time employees because I didn't actually know what was happening day to day. I was doing so much stuff at so many different times that I needed to sit down for a whole week just to really go through the details. Like, it's not just launch a webinar. Actually, there's lots of activities to do launch a webinar <laughs> and you don't realize it because you're just doing it uh, sort of monotonously and sort of robotically, right? Until you have to hire someone and go, this is actually what it takes to do yeah. a webinar, for example. Yeah, and the, and the other thing that, you know, we sort of talked about it in, in Driver One, but it's around that automation. So the other thing that we really do is try to use technology and automate as much as possible so yeah. you don't have to have as many people on. And I, I still think, you know, that's where you can be really smart. We've got a, a separate business that, that I'm uh, an investor in and we run, which sort of helps companies set up their technology stack. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's where you can get gains. Like Coca-Cola, yes, they had lots of people. But if you walk into a factory now in Coca-Cola, there's probably, you know, one-tenth of the people that even 10 years ago were there because now they've got robots and they've got other things that they've constantly implemented so that, you know, because hiring people in your business is one of the riskiest things you'll ever do. So how can you actually help the existing people so that you don't have to carry that much risk. So I think that's where technology can really play its part as well. Love that, Paul. Thank you so very much for giving us those five drivers. They're, they're really great for us to think about whether you think you're in that stage or not. Uh, it's a good forecast about what you're working towards and needing to make sure you get all those areas cleaned up and, and started out and so that you can have a business you actually like going to uh, and it's actually rewarding you, right, in a way that yes. is going to be deeply satisfying, obviously profit, profitable, uh, but bringing you back into the reason why you started a business in the first place, right, for freedom and flexibility, of course. Uh, now, now, Paul, if I, I mean, I'm definitely wanting to hire you for helping us build that team. But a lot of people that are, are in that stage of business that would be a great fit uh, for your community, uh, for your um, your mastermind at Built Live Give. Uh, how do we find out more about your work, and, and what can some people uh, get started on today if they were interested to work with you? 
Yeah, so um, you can go to uh, buildlivegive.com right. and there's a business audit on the website that we uh, you can basically go in and help fill out. So it actually gets you to ask some of these key questions around the five drives and find out exactly where you are. And then if you do want to uh, join our membership, we've got a boost membership, which um, you, you can join, you know, there you get access to me, direct coaching, and you also get access to all of our suppliers to help you start filling that team. And uh, we've uh, got a, an offer at the moment where you can trial it for a dollar USD wow. for a month. And um, I'm sure that you'll have the links there that people can go and see that, yes. um, see that offer. Perfect. Yes, I am going. We're going to make sure you get the links for uh, Paul's website uh, for the special uh, promotion for the dollar trial, which is great to just dip your feet in, uh, get a taste of Paul <laughs> and his community, and really make sure that you get the help you need before you invest further. Which is an excellent and very generous and fair way uh, that you're doing that, Paul. Uh, I definitely uh, can't wait to speak to you uh, offline about building our team here at Screw the Cubicle because there's sometimes when you're in the business so much, it's hard to see the forest from the trees, and you need a bit of neutral perspective as someone that can uh, that I've done right what you're trying to do uh, and I can't wait to dig into that with you uh, we'll be sharing for all the viewers here we'll be sharing uh, access of ways you can get a hold of Paul thank him for this interview if something resonated with you uh, and of course for you to join uh, the dollar trial and be part of the built live give community uh, as I think that Paul's doing some amazing work we have lots of synchronicity here uh, with him at screw the cubicle as well and we can't wait for you to uh, get a taste of what Paul's all about and we hope you get to join that community as well Thanks, Paul, for everything that uh, you gave today. And it's been, I could go on for this conversation for a few more hours. We can dig into those five drivers even in more detail. So we'll have to get you back on the show. Yeah, great. Thanks, Lydia. I really appreciate the opportunity and, and love the work that you're doing and, and for you and your community. And, and I think, you know, the, the key message I want to leave is that there are options. So if you're in a job at the moment that you're not really loving, the boss is going to, you know, you're that sick feeling. You've got to go in on Monday again and you're going to have to be faced with something that you don't want. You want to take control. Please look at the great work that Lydia is doing and, uh, you know, screw that. <laughs> that cubicle might leave exactly. and uh, you'll never regret it. It's, a, it's a, a fantastic experience. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Paul. And thank you guys for joining us. Uh, come visit us at the video blog. If you're watching this in any other channel, we have more to give you uh, on our blog and make sure that you are connected to Paul as well. Thanks everyone for joining us. Bye. Have you been desiring to create a life and career that gives you the freedom that you deserve, but you're not quite sure where to start? Well, let me be the guide to help you quit that job that's crushing your soul, discover your strengths, and make money doing something that you love and will care about. Head over to screwthecubicle.com to find tools and resources I've created just for you to help you jumpstart your escape plan from your nine to five and launch a business you can run from anywhere.